Hi, welcome back. And happy early spring, which is the most exciting news we've had in a while. We're going to follow up on Stony Phil, but he said that there's going to be an early spring this year. Therefore, it must be true. He has been prognosticating for 150 years, roughly. 30, 140 years? I don't know, late 1800s is when he started. And he is interestingly, if you go back and look, he's more often wrong than he is right. Which is odd, because you think that, you know, just by chance, you better. He's statistically more often wrong than than he's right. So if anything, it's probably the opposite. Sure. The safer bet to bet on more winter. Does everybody know about this? I see some like, confused faces. Fox Stunning Phil is a groundhog. Groundhog is an animal in the marmot. Oh, I'll find an image. Um, I mean, has it has it, have people here seen the movie Groundhog Day? Uh, yeah. Not a great movie. Okay. Oh, the guy who lived the same day over and over again. This is him. Use a marmot. It looks like this. He has handlers. Handlers are called the inner circle. There are these people with top hat and whatnot. So how often do they switch out what groundhog it is? Uh, they don't. It's always the same one. It's still. Of course. He's been doing this for about 140 years, <laughs> if I remember correctly. He lives in a tree trunk, comes out on Groundhog's, Groundhog's Day every year, and depending on whether he sees his shadow or not, there will be six more weeks of winter or an early spring. Um, plot hole, apparently, Please correct me, uh, but if I remember correctly, if he sees his shadow, there are going to be six more weeks of winter, which does not compute for me because if he sees his shadow, it means the sun is out, means it's warmer, therefore it must be early spring. But somehow the interpretation is the opposite. That's probably why he's wrong most of the time. I, I know we put two and two together. Anyway, very exciting. So this was the highlight of the news cycle this past week. Uh, early spring was given. I look forward to that. Um, okay, now coming back to our class, I um, started reviewing your lit review write-ups, uh, and I've been sending feedback to some of you. I have been making very slow progress. I'm sorry I was busy yesterday and this morning. Uh, hopefully by the end of the week, I will finish with all of them, uh, but I'm you know, taking my time to read them and give you detailed feedback, which is why I'm moving slowly. I appreciate your patience. I will do them as quickly as I can. Um, number two, I was looking at the calendar today, and according to my calculations, which may or may not be as accurate as Phil's, the project proposal deadline and presentations is exactly two weeks from today. Um, we'll probably do it in class on Tuesday, whatever day that it is, two weeks from today. Um, so this is a good time to remind you to start thinking about your research projects for this class. I have prepared a quick write-up. I'll, I'll send the link to this. You can. You know, look it up afterwards. The gist of it, is, let me make it bigger. Gist of it is, I cannot make it bigger. Um, that I would like you all to work on a, a serious mixed methods research project for this class. Um, it is solely okay to double count, meaning if you're already working or planning on doing a mixed methods research project for your PhD research or otherwise, it's totally okay to double count that for this class. That's on purpose. Um, two weeks from now, you will tell me and the rest of the class 
what that project is going to be will give us a quick, very quick, sort of five minute per person style overview, maybe two, three slides, giving us the gist, you know, what's the research question? What's roughly the research design? What are the different components? What methods are you using? How are you mixing them, planning on mixing them? Um, and maybe why this all makes sense. Um, okay, then at the end of the semester, you will have hopefully completed most of the work for this or are well on your way to doing that. And you'll write up a paper-like report that will count as the final deliverable, final project for this class. That's the bulk of your grade as well. That, that's really what this is all about. Um, so I, I'm setting this up in a way I think causes you the least amount of overhead while being most useful to your actual research as possible. Um, please tell me if you have other ideas to make this even more efficient. But I, I would like this class to be an opportunity to further your actual research to maybe step up your methods game a bit more than you know, without taking it or, or otherwise for me to be a resource and as helpful to you as possible in your actual research. So it's totally fine if you're going to use a project you're actually working on for your research with your PhD advisors or collaborators, also for this class. It is not fine to hand in something that you've done already. Um, so the work has to be new. You have to, you have to do something new. You know, it's okay if you've done some preliminary work that you're going to build on, um, but it has to be new work that you're starting on doing or planning on starting on doing very soon if you haven't already. It has to be new work by and large. Um, and it has to make sense. It has to make sense to you first and foremost. If you, sometimes this happens, if you are, I don't know, are bored with your actual research, you maybe want to do something else or you want to learn, you know, a different method, totally okay. Lots of ideas of projects, you know, we could do together or you know, maybe you have your own ideas and I'm happy to brainstorm with you. Totally okay to do something for the purpose of this class that does not count towards your PhD advisor satisfaction. Uh, but I think it's easier for you if you, you know, do something you actually have to do anyway. I saw a question or not. Okay, so this is my, what's going to be most of the work for this class. I hope, you know, hope that by the end of the semester, you will have gotten super far with this, uh, the way this is written, and you will, you know, see, you can ask me, it's okay if you haven't quite completed everything. You know, I know research sometimes takes longer. Uh, this class is relatively very short. Uh, so that's okay, but I want you to have made lots of progress by the end uh, and have something tangible and substantial to talk about and write about in your final reports. Um, it's also totally okay to pair up. Okay? If it makes sense to you or uh, if you want to do something new, you know, this is an opportunity to maybe find a new collaborator, make a friend, you know, whatever it may be. You're already collaborating with somebody for your own research, it's okay to maintain that. You can pair up as long as you argue why that makes sense. It's not a problem at all. Okay. The only constraint here at a design level is that you think of this as a mixed methods research project where you know you use different methods and you will combine them in a way that makes sense and strengthens the overall conclusions of your study and the overall design. That's the only constraint. I want you to think about how you can benefit from a mixed method design in your research. Okay? Right. Um, very good. So what I'd like to do today is two things. I would like to talk about some of the kind of nitty gritty methodological details of doing interviews. We read cool examples a week ago. Um, today I wanna to cover more of the kind of methods, details of this in the first half, and hopefully we have time for an in-class activity in the second half, kind of workshop and interview guide or protocol together. Um, and we will be conducting a few interviews 
on your own as the next one of the assignments, which will come up later today. Building on the first one, the lit review, you'll be doing a few interviews on this topic of uh, bias in student evaluations of teachers. Okay. That's the plan. So without further ado, uh, oh yeah, so I'm roughly, I, I stole what I thought were good points from all of these readings and I tried to condense them in this lecture, which I will uh, walk you through today. Uh, but please, you know, go back to the original sources as always for much better, much richer discussion of all of this material. Okay, so we talk about interviews, um, you know, quite a bit in this class because they're probably the most common method of data gathering, data gathering qualitative research. We talked last time about how interviews are a data collection, data gathering method. They're not a data analysis method. Um, and there are various forms of, I wish I could have a closer so I could move the window. There we go. There are various forms of qualitative research interviews. You can think of different axes to kind of place them on. Uh, in terms of questions you're asking, you know, they could range between very specific ones and very general ones. In terms of the order in which you're asking these questions, that could be entirely predetermined or fixed, kind of like a questionnaire, you're walking through that, or it could be very flexible and evolving. Um, and in terms of the responses, you could ask for you know, very precise, I don't know, counts of things or what have you, um, or you could ask for open-ended uh, answers, responses. And so probably the kind of interview that you will encounter most often in research that we do in CS or in software engineering um, or in societal computing are the semi-structured interviews. But these tend to have semi-specific questions. The order, there is some, there's some order to um, the questions, but there's a lot of flexibility in, in how you ask them. Um, and usually they're very open-ended. Um, you know, we usually prefer to run surveys to need very precise answers. Uh, and we use the interviews for very open-ended things that are hard to get otherwise. Okay. Uh, we talked about some of this, you know, why, why you might consider doing interviews. We talked about some of this last time. Uh, one anecdote. So we, we can validate data. Uh, so one of the uh, readings I cited a few slides ago tells the story of a researcher uh, at Microsoft Research who was doing some data analysis, quantitative data analysis. And he had uh, mined a whole bunch of data. I think he was studying code review, how engineers at Microsoft perform code reviews to improve the quality of their code. Um, and had collected a bunch of data and was analyzing it. In the process of analyzing that data, had discovered that a whole bunch of these code reviews that he had mined data uh, before um, seemed instantaneous. So, you know, the author of the code submitted the code, and then the reviewer reviewed it and commented on it seemingly instantaneously. Uh, and, you know, at first he was very confused, you know, he thought there was some mistake and the way he had scraped all of his data and whatnot, he, you know, went back and figured out there wasn't any and you know, the original data was indeed uh, the data that he had gathered and, you know, he talked about how he used interviews to validate what was going on. What was going on, if I recall correctly, was um, people were essentially doing the code reviews offline and in person. And then they were just sort of submitting the patch and the comments uh, after they had already agreed on, on what the review was. So, you know, the, the artifact you saw recorded online reflected, had a longer history of, of interaction and communication that had happened offline. So, you know, very interesting way um, in, in which you can use interviews to validate weird artifacts um, that you would get in data otherwise. So, I, I learned that lesson reading this, and I've, I've, been, I've been using it since. To collect some data that doesn't quite make sense, you know, often a good strategy is to go back and talk to the people that maybe produced that data in the first place and try to figure out what was going on. 
Um, right, we talked about this last time. I'm not going to insist now about how you can also use interviews to do quantitative research. We tend not to do that so much. We tend to prefer surveys because they're more scalable, but you know, in principle, you could do that. Um, let's see. Right, so the goal of an interview is typically to, uh, for you, the researcher, to see whatever topic you're studying from the perspective of your interviewees, uh, to understand how and why they came to have this particular perspective. If you remember our discussion of the social constructivist worldview, and this is a reflection of that, you're trying to see the world through the eyes of your informants. Uh, so that means, you know, usually, flexibility in, in how you're asking these questions, uh, preponderance of open questions, um, and so specifics, like focusing on you know, lived experiences or tasks or events or actions or what have you that your informants uh, have direct knowledge of versus general opinions and abstractions uh, about things. Why do you think that is? Why can't we ask about general opinions and abstraction? Or we can, of course, why shouldn't we? Why should we focus on specific things? Yes, please. Maybe you're not controlling for much if you're speaking in like, if you're, if you're like, well, these are very general things. So. Uh, it's it seems it seems like you like you might get a variety of responses and, it, and maybe maybe if you do a lot of a lot of interviews it might be like possible to establish like statistical significance across like you know certain groups of like responses but it seems like if you want if you're looking for something in particular then you should just like sort of ask for things that are relevant to that thing instead of having to sort of sort it all sort it all out later by yourself. Yes, so I, I agree with this, you know, maybe let's, um, let's work for you, you know, analyzing data afterwards. I'm thinking something even more basic than this, though. Um, I, I agree with the point, but something even more, more basic. Let's see, what else? Um, it's probably a lot easier to accidentally introduce bias into your question when you ask an open-ended question is, I guess, that I so it's not about open-ended versus closed-ended. It's more about you know, specific situations and actions versus more general opinions and whatnot about you know things or whatever. Okay. Well, there's that, and also um, people might also just get it wrong. Like you, you can say something, and you know, if if the just asking your opinion isn't always reliable. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah. I I think. Uh, if the question is too general, it will lose some details, and it is a detail sent. Uh, the details matter. The details matter. I agree with this. Yes. Um, I came across this in my lit review when there was a paper, a new recent paper on how to write better questions for uh, faculty about evaluations, mm -hmm. and, and it emphasized that you shouldn't have the students say something uh, what, what, what concrete about the uh, what the uh, Instructor did like the instructor graded assignments on time rather than uh, I thought the instructor. Do you think the instructor was effective and then that could, could introduce bias and opinion? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I think it's much harder to uh, draw conclusions if uh, you, are, you are trying to study some more generic situation instead of focus on a specific. But, but why? How? Because yeah. you have less variance. Uh, on the on the, the responses that were. I think that was Samantha's point also, but something else. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, I think it is unlikely that one person's opinion will generalize to uh, capture what is actually important because that's the research that you're doing, I suppose. So if you ask like, uh, you know, what's important, like what's important to them might not be what's important to the whole topic that are. I agree with all of, the, all of these points, but I'm looking for something much more trivial in a way than this. Uh, namely, that people just make stuff up. Okay? They will tell you what you want to hear, and it's completely worthless. That, that's really the reason why it's like, you know, maybe the number one bit 
uh, number one most valuable bit of information about how to ask, how to conduct interviews, how to ask questions, is to focus on specifics over generalities and opinions. Because people will make stuff up and tell you only what you want to hear. Right? You cannot it's completely a waste of everyone's time. That's really the number one reason why, plus all of the things you all mentioned. Just out of curiosity, was there like a study done that showed that? Sure, yeah. yeah. Like, psychologists love to do these kinds of studies. That's, that's so cool. People making stuff up. I don't have a citation at hand. But yeah, sure, sure. Okay. If, if you do end up having one, um, if you could send it to the last chat. I should look for more citations on this. Uh, possible, if you go through the things I cite for this lecture, you will find more references. I would start there. Yeah. I think a lot of interview studies, like it's called social desirability uh, bias. That's one of them, yeah. yeah that's, that's one of the limitations that many interview studies will mention in the limitation part. Right. Yes. Uh, but so, remember this one thing, right? You know, whenever you ask questions, ask for concrete examples of things and concrete situations that the person has participated in themselves, the direct first-hand experience knowledge of the over general opinions. Would it be okay to combine those things? So for example, start with the specific ones and at the end ask for more general things? No, it's maybe the other way around. You can start from you know the general things, uh, but then ask for concrete instances of, um, but only then when you get into the concrete instances of that you can, start to trust what you're hearing. Yeah, I think, you know, opinions worth nothing. Concrete evidence worth something. Okay. Um, so, you know, why interviews in general, why are they good? Because they allow you follow-ups, you know, over surveys, you can go back and forth and ask follow-up questions and make sure you, know, you got as much information as, as you possibly could from your informants. Um, possibly you can you know, access information that is not reported anywhere else, right, through interviews. So that's you know, valuable. Um, also easier, probably more rich information that is available through oral communication than um, you might get in writing, simply because the effort for somebody to write down all of these kinds of things is greater. Plus, you don't have an opportunity to follow up and prompt them, prompt them for more information, if that's the case. Um, so it's harder to write, and there's no follow up so Overall, it's probably less information. Um, you can always triangulate information you get from interviews with our data sources. Very common mixed methods design, by the way. We've seen some examples last week people starting with interviews and then triangulating their findings through other methods. We've already seen some examples. Uh, you can use them to clarify things that have already happened. There are cons, usually small sample size. There's only so many people you can interview before you get tired um, because it takes a bunch of time to schedule and conduct these. Logistics are potentially complicated. Um, biases introduced by the interviewer, we'll see some examples in a minute. How you phrase things, how you uh, act, how the tone of your voice, etc. All of these can impact your performance. It takes some time to transcribe all of this data and do some quality of analysis. We're going to use an LLM, hopefully, uh, this semester. See if that works. We can do quality of analysis with chat GPT or something like that. Um, okay, so you know, obviously, as with anything, you start with the research question. Um, you then create the interview guide, also known as protocol. That's a technical term, interview protocol or interview guide, containing sets of questions, the high-level themes you want to ask people about, maybe concrete questions and prompts. Um, you go recruit some participants, you conduct the interviews, and you analyze the data. We talked about research questions before. We're going to talk about analysis later. But today I'm going to focus on the interview guide. Um, 
it's not a formal schedule. It's not a questionnaire. You don't go through things one by one in the order you write them down. But it's it's a guide. It's something to help you structure the conversation to keep track of where you are. Um, you should list topics that you want to cover. Um, probes is another technical term here. Um, you can list probes that you can use as follow-up to elicit more information from your participants. Uh, those are part of the guide. Um, and the guides need not be the static artifacts that you create once at the beginning of the study before conducting any interviews, and then it never changes. In fact, it, that's probably a bad idea. Um, a better idea is to learn from the first few interviews you conduct you know, about questions you maybe hadn't considered asking or questions that would seem confusing to your informants and you come up with better ways of asking them or you know, whatever else um, may be the case. But the, the guide also evolves together with your study. You know, maybe you discover new interesting topics from some of these early interviews and then you add explicit probes and questions to your guide for follow-up interviews with new people uh, afterwards to get more information about that new phenomenon. That's a common thing that has happened to us. Um, okay. In general, you can think of um, the structure of an interview protocol as having this hourglass uh, structure, kind of you know, starting broad and ending broad, kind of going into you know, detail, detail, detail somewhere in the middle. So, you know. Maybe some introduction and some background about the study, about yourselves, some high level opening questions to establish rapport and will not make people comfortable. Um, maybe about satisfactions and frustrations and what have you. Um, and then follow ups with uh, detail, more and more details, concrete examples, concrete situations, et cetera, and specific areas to elaborate on. Uh, and then you can go back uh, out and, and broaden the scope again. You, know, you can ask your informants about other things that they may wish to add or other questions that you should have asked them, other things they want to mention and so on. And you wrap up and you thank them for their time and whatnot, maybe tell them what's going to happen next with the data that they're providing. Um, and, and then move on from there. Um, and then uh, typical practice include many information seeking questions, followed up with probes to explore their specific views and experiences in more depth. Um, I mentioned this already, prefer questions that focus on concrete examples, not generalities. Um, and you can incorporate in your guide both fully formed questions as well as just topic headings that you can make up questions uh, about uh, on the fly if, if, if they come up. Okay, um, including participants. Right. This is maybe worth talking for a second. We saw, I don't know how much we saw this in the example papers. Maybe it'll, we talked about maximum variation sampling maybe a bit before. I'm going to mention this again. It is, again, a technical term. There's different sampling strategies for um, participants in these interview studies. Um, and usually, you don't just randomly choose a sampling strategy or participants, but rather you decide on a sampling strategy depending on your actual research questions and goals. We talked before, I think, about this maximum variation sampling, where you're deliberately trying to elicit as diverse opinions as possible, or you're talking to as different people as possible, because you expect they um, have very different opinions and experiences and or not about the subject at hand. And that's useful for you and you know, teasing out these you know, interesting elements of your theory. We saw some examples, I think last week, where they tried to have a very diverse sample of uh, participants in terms of uh, age and whatever else. And they're arguing maybe that, that those variables are important for, for their study. Okay, so that, that's one. Maybe that's the most common. I think if you're trying to make sense of some new phenomenon, that's probably a good idea. Uh, but there are also others. You know, maybe you want to see what's most common. Uh, right? So instead of maximum variation, which exposes all of these you know, corner cases and, and unusual experiences, maybe you 
deliberately want to focus on the most unusual experiences. Maybe in, uh, in contrast, you want to focus on the most common, the most typical experiences. If you're sort of trying to think uh, quantitatively, what is the most common thing that people do? That's a driving goal behind your study. You want to find kind of what are the most typical situations, um, and, and you know things in between. But the point the point of this is you don't just randomly invite people or, to, or ask people to participate in these studies. You think very carefully about kind of what it is you're trying to expose with this uh, analysis, and you choose uh, participants deliberately based on on those questions and goals. Sure. Uh, what's the difference between critical, uh, extreme, and sensitive cases? Yeah, not entirely sure. Um, extreme is sort of in terms of the opposite of typical, if you will. So think of a normal distribution. Typical would be the people in the middle, and extreme and so on would be the people on the on the tails. Um, I don't remember what critical is exactly. Uh, so. Readings again. The original sources that I said in the beginning are are where to find this. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We also talked about this before last week. You know, when do you stop? We talked about this notion of theoretical saturation. You stop when you are not learning anything new. Um, I don't. Have we seen? In the papers we read last week, were there concrete stopping criteria for the researchers, or did they just claim they had reached saturation? Anybody remember? Once I read only said that they reached saturation, but not say why. Yeah, the most common paper. Paper I see or I read it just says, you know, we reach saturation, so we stopped after however many. Uh, sometimes you see people formalizing a stopping criterion and saying, you know, we stop when after n interviews, we have, haven't discovered any new codes or themes or something. Um, and that's maybe a more formal way of, of stopping. But either way, sort of, you know, at some point you just stop, maybe you get bored. Uh, that's not a good reason, by the way, to stop. You just get bored, probably not a good reason. But if you're hearing the same things over and over again, you know, probably probably good and close to good enough reason to stop. Well, is there sure. like a statistical um, formulation of like how how many times you've seen, heard the same thing over again that, that that the next interview you will hear the same thing over again? Is, have you heard of that? Um, mm, not that I know of. But also remember if you're Goal is maximum variation. Um, that's somewhat antithetical. Like you would be inclined to talk to everyone so that you can find all, you know, all unusual experiences, right? Um, if your goal is to kind of find all of these endpoints of your theory, then you know maybe it doesn't matter. If you, you want to keep, you want to keep probing. Um, but it's not it's not practical, obviously, to talk to everyone. Yeah. Um, gatekeeper, the subjects. Okay. Um, so what actually happens in the interview? Let's talk about this for a minute. This is a uh, diagram illustrating the different steps. And this process of conducting an interview, starting from motivating your participants to provide you with useful information, um, asking them questions, listening to what they're saying, and, and really trying to understand what they're saying, probing them for follow up, maintaining control of the process and interview, reinforcing what you've heard, uh, maybe reporting the information uh, and ending. No, I stole this from the class at CMU, by the way, uh, which may or may not be offered. Uh, so if you want to, I don't know, uh, take another class on how to conduct interviews, that's where I got this from. Question. Say again? Uh, what is the differences between the asking and the probing? I will go through all of these one by one. 
Yeah, I'll, we'll get there in a minute. So let me start with the first one, motivating. So here it's about motivating the interviewees to be used to you to uh, provide you with good information. Um, so good practice is to start by explaining to them uh, what is expected of them. Make sure they understand what you're asking them to do and what kind of information they're expected to provide. Um, but also logistical, practical things, you know, how long the thing is going to take, um, what kind of expertise is required, et cetera. Um, also tell them how the information is going to be used to make sure they're comfortable with that. Uh, you know, maybe they're afraid or anxious that you might, uh, you know, complain to their superiors about something they've said if they're fully honest with you. Uh, so tell them, you know, how you will preserve their confidentiality and what you will do with the information and, and, and so on. Right, so basically make sure you create and maintain an atmosphere in which your respondents feel fully understood and safe to communicate fully without fear of being judged or criticized. Remember the uh, sex workers paper we read last week? That's sort of, you know, kind of hard to talk about probably for people. Like conducting those interviews requires some skill. I, I appreciate that, you know, I think the research team did a great job there. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you want to conduct these interviews without making your participants feel judged or criticized, for example. Um, and you know, provide periodic reinforcement of the progress uh, of the interview. You know, remind your participants that uh, you appreciate their input and their information is helpful to you and valuable, and that you're making good progress and, and so on. Good probably to have thought about answers to these questions before you uh, conduct any interview. Why are you doing the study in the first place? Uh, what are you going to get out of it? Where are they going to get out of it? What's, what's in it for the informants? Can they benefit from the results of your study in any way? Um, what does the uh, company that employs you or the university you work for or you know, whoever else that's behind the study, what do they get out of this? Who's paying for all of this? Kind of what are the hidden interests? Is there, is there a hidden agenda perhaps? What happens to the data? You know, is it public? Do they receive it? How are you going to protect it? Is it going to be confidential? How long is it going to take? We talked about this before. Um, and, and why why you chose them? Why you selected them to participate? In, in what way uh, are they special, if you will, or how can they help you with your study as opposed to random other person that you could have talked to? So you know, good to have thought about these um, and uh, maybe you know, open with a summary of some of these, you know, the goals and so on, what happens to who the data, sorry, who the study is for, how the data is going to be used, how the findings are going to change the world, et cetera. Okay, so that's sort of motivating. I'm setting the scene, making people feel comfortable, uh, setting the context for behind the study and, and so on. Then how do you ask questions? This is the maybe hardest part. So here are some tips. Number one, avoid asking multiple questions at once. For example, why did you join this open source project? And do you think it has brought benefits to your programming experience? This is a bad question because it is not a question, but two questions. Okay. So somebody being asked this question may choose to answer the first part or the second part or something completely different still, but you're asking too many things all at once. Bad idea. Okay. So you know, very practical advice here. Don't do this. Um, Try to not ask leading questions in which so the expected answer is embedded. For example, um, you so you felt that using this AI assistant really improved your productivity, didn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but you hopefully you get the point. Right? Mm -hmm. Instead, a more neutral way of asking the same question could be, 
what, if any, impact did using this tool have on your current group? Right, so the if any part is important here because you're allowing for the possibility that it did not have any effect. Um, so, or your parents pushed you to study, didn't they? That's why you were at the university. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking, I just, this is just want to confirm my premonition, but so it says, what if any impact did NL2 code have? An alternative way to ask is what impact did it have or did it have any impact? And if so, what? Hmm. Yeah. You wouldn't ask it like that because that's two questions, even though it's like the same thing. Um, or does it not matter? You know, maybe that's sort of clear enough and short enough that you could ask it this way. You could also ask them one at a time. Did it have any impact? And they say, I, I think so. And then you ask, you know, tell me more. You know, what, what impact did it have? Okay, so that's not such a bad thing. If... I think in general, avoid asking two things at once. Maybe this one's kind of simple, short enough that you could, uh, but okay. you can also easily break it up in two. I think it would work the way you're describing. Thank you. Um, so, or finally, you know, how satisfied were you with this AI tool? Because you know the word "satisfied" implies already some degree of satisfaction, right? They, they could not have been dissatisfied. That's not an option you're you're providing them with. You're implying that they should have been satisfied at least to some extent. Right? So the only variable is to what extent they were satisfied, but they could not have been dissatisfied. Which is implicit based on phrasing of your question. Uh, in reality, many companies service will ask, uh, do you feel satisfied with our product? Yeah, sure. But the company's goals are to sell their product. Oh. The, the company's goals are not to you know, uh, generate unbiased scientific evidence. But company wants to make money and sell products. Uh, why they do the survey? If they just want to sell the product, they, can, they should get the new Neutral suggestions, not some bias suggestions. Do I have yes? Yes, I think it's it's actually due to um, internal metrics. So there might be some internal politics where, the, say, the sales team wants to look good and, and like they want to make a loaded question, so that their their answer to be biased towards the positive side rather than um, uh, rather than have a, an accurate view. Maybe also, you know, let's let's be generous. Uh, maybe just people haven't thought about. The phrasing of their questions too deeply. Yeah, so they, they chose a question that was intuitive, maybe it made sense to them. But they didn't think too critically about how they were asking it and if it could bias the answers and so on. Maybe they didn't know any better, or maybe they're very evil and they're trying to. You know, the sales team is trying to make itself look good. I just quick thing. I, I remember reading about how a lot of like online ads are not are supposedly not very effective, and companies overspent on online ads that could be spent very effectively. Mm -hmm. I've kind of read this. I don't know how effective this is. What, why do you think that is, or how how is it related to uh, raising of questions? Oh, um, basically, it's one of those like biased, like in, not biased things where like say. Internal company thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So there are lots of politics in any company. Yeah. Right. So there could be politics in you know customer satisfaction service too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Here's another one. Avoid assuming that the answer to a question is so obvious that it need not be asked. Because what is obvious to you, the the interviewer, the researcher may not be obvious to your participants. For example, here we're asking, how concerned are you about your privacy online? What's the what's the assumption? Privacy is important. So how would you start differently? How important do you think privacy is? 
Well, you could just change how to are you. Mm -hmm. Like, are you concerned about your privacy? Yeah, that would be my guess. The most simple thing you could probably do. Which would you know, remove this implicit assumption. So I see how subtle some of these things are. Um, I, I have, I think not today, but I have when we talk about survey design, probably next week, um, I have some cool evidence showing you how much the answers can differ when you ask questions in a slightly different way. And I don't have, you know, for this particular phrasing um, studies to show that, but I have for other ones next week. Um, it was amazing to me to see how much uh, the responses can vary with such small changes in the in the question itself. So, uh, using the word "concerned" in here, can it be already leading to a answer? Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, in the same way that the one before, what was it? Satisfied, mm -hmm. concerned, like satisfied. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, another one still. So this is sort of, this is going to be interesting and very tricky. I don't have a good solution for this. I talked a bit, I'm gonna talk more possibly about how um, you should reinforce what people are saying. Um, I think we have a, even a reinforcement bit in, in the circle, but at the same time, you should avoid imposing your own interpretation when you're doing this. So this to me seems very hard. So for example, here, you know, let's say somebody says something, um, a way for you to um, feed that back to them while imposing your own perception would be to respond like this. So, so, you know, so what you're really saying is that this AI assistant really helped with your productivity, right? So what you're really saying is this, you know, they tell you something and then you're telling them back what you're really saying is, whatever you interpret it. Okay? This is a way for you to impose your own perception rather than to collect theirs and to sort of destroy you know, biases, the, uh, the data you're, you're getting. Uh, but at the same time, it's useful, right? It's useful to you know, reinforce things they've said to make sure you've understood what it is they're, they're saying, that you've you know, heard everything and, and so on. So I don't have a good solution. I'm struggling with this myself, right? What's the right balance between reinforcing things um, and, you know, potentially biasing things, imposing your own perception. Like, how do you do this in the most neutral way so that it's useful, but, but you know, does not bias the, uh, the data? Anyway, so, something to keep in mind as you're thinking about this. Um, okay, maybe this is obvious. Avoid ending on a difficult, threatening, or painful topic. You don't want people to leave the interview with you know feeling upset or, or something uh, based on uh, this last thing you're you're ending on, uh, but but rather you know finish with something more positive. For example, you can always do this: give people an opportunity to make more comments about the subject at hand, which um, have not been covered already in the interview. For example, by asking, "What if anything else should I have asked you?" This is an opportunity for them to provide you with more questions you could have asked them in the first place. Okay, ask questions in a simple, direct, clear manner. Make sure people understand what you're asking. Uh, but do be flexible. The topic order may change during your interview. So you don't have to stick to the protocol and the order of things there. Um, and do try to open with a question which can be answered easily and directly and without potential embarrassment or distress, something to just establish rapport and make people comfortable. For example, you can ask people to describe their, if you're interviewing practitioners, you can ask them to describe their role at the company or something like that, you know, something they can surely comfortably you know, answer, describing what it is that they do with their job or something like that. Basically, requests for factual or descriptive information. Okay. Um, when you ask over any questions, and you should, you can have different kinds of questions. Here are some examples. Grant tour style questions. Uh, walk me through a day in your work life from 
the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, for example. So a grand tour where they walk you through this whole uh, experience. Note, keyword there, the second question, I'm saying reconstruct your day. This is very important. I'm not saying remember your day. I'm going to come back to this in a, in a minute. Reconstruct, very different from remember, as it turns out. Fascinating psychology. Uh, activates different parts of your brain. Right? Reconstructing an event uses different parts of your brain than memory. Okay, so memory is the bad one we want to avoid because people don't remember things and they tell you what you want to hear and they like you anyway. Memory is bad, but living through an event, reconstructing an event is good, presumably, because it sort of, you know, brings out these factual details. So when I, when I first read this, I thought it was fascinating, right, that, you know, something as subtle as this could activate different brain processes for you know, kind of providing that information back to you. So it was, it was fascinating. Okay, so these are grand tour style questions or you know, subjective experience questions like what was attending this class like for you? Awesome, right? This particular class, that's never awesome. Amazing. Really, I have to work on my humor. I've been told. <laughs> okay. It's okay. I keep trying. Never give up. Um, do follow up on what people say. Ask for clarification details. Uh, again, concrete details. Ask for stories. Uh, whatever you ask for, it's fine, but as long as it's concrete. Of course, trust your instincts. Explore emerging topics as uh, they come up. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, the point from earlier, ask to reconstruct, not remember. So what happened triggers this reconstruction process because they have to kind of walk through that experience, that event in their heads, versus do you remember what happened, which triggers memory, which apparently is bad. Amazing. So this is maybe the second thing to remember. First thing was ask for concrete things over general things. Second thing is reconstruct, not remember for today. Okay. I'm making a list of things to, to take home. Okay, concrete details. So that was asking. Now listening and understanding, coming back to your question. So here, you know, listening means Picking up on all the cues you have available, verbal, nonverbal, um, facts and feelings, kind of interpreting also what they're not saying, not only what they're saying. Does that make sense? Uh, and again, this to me seems very risky and dangerous because it seems very prone to you imposing your biases and perceptions and whatnot. Um, right. It's not you know, direct information anymore. It's you're, you're reading more into what they're saying and maybe not saying, right? And interpreting that. So this is risky, uh, but seems to be also useful. Like, you know, the tone with which they are, I don't know, talking about their managers or something, you know, may tell you something about the relationship or whatever it may be, you know, asking PhD students about their PhD advisors, you know, maybe how how they respond, like right, tells you something about that relationship or something. Um, okay, and then understanding means empathy, basically. You know, put yourself in their shoes, try not to be judgmental. Um, don't prematurely analyze or draw conclusions. Try to put yourself in, in their shoes, basically, in their frame of reference. Um, okay, advice is listen more or talk less. 
uh, inner voice versus outer voice is the thing I mentioned before, kind of also the things they're not saying. Um, one way to see how well you're doing is to go back through the transcripts or listen to the recording of an interview and see how much of that time is you asking and speaking versus how much is the participant telling you things. Um, and you should, it should be more of the participant providing information than you know you lecturing the participants in an interview. Okay, uh, so that was listening and uh, understanding, probing, different kinds of probes. So probes are these you know, questions uh, you ask to follow up and ask for more information. You have different kinds of probes. They could be open-ended, things like, what were the major responsibilities of your most recent job? This is even something you could start the interview with, kind of a factual description. Uh, that should not elicit any stress, ideally. Um, they could be specific. You know, Maybe they tell you something like, I've always had the ability to learn a new programming language quickly. And then you can probe them by saying, what specific steps did you take to learn a new language? Okay. So again, asking for specifics, not opinions, not generalities, right? And, and steps should trigger a reconstruction. You, they walk you through the things they did as opposed to memory, things they remember or thing they did. Okay. Uh, maybe you say something like, um, how would you rate your, you ask, how would you rate your contribution to this open source project? And then they respond by saying, I think I'm a major contributor. So you follow up, you probe them with something like, I'm glad to hear that. What contributions in particular, what specific contributions made you feel that way? Okay. And then you get some concrete examples. Right, so their opinion, you know, it's worth nothing without this additional concrete evidence, examples, uh, experiencing, et cetera, without the specifics. Um, bipolar probes. Most people I talked to can identify aspects of working remotely that really like, that they really like, um, and other aspects of working remotely that they dislike. Would you tell me about those aspects that you really like? And they tell you something. Then you follow up and you ask the same question again about the aspect that they dislike. Okay. This would be a bipolar probe. You're kind of offering both of these possibilities, things they hate and things they love, and you go through them one by one. Okay. Do you want the, um, the sort of prefacing information so that they feel like, if they really like it, they feel okay with telling you things they dislike because they know they'll have the chance to talk about the things they like. Possibly, I think so. I think so. An elaboration probe, something like, is there anything else? Or what else can you think about? Or any other thoughts? Very simple. Um, reflected, reflecting feelings. So they say something like, I've been here for 15 years and I don't feel like I've been treated fairly. So here is when you reinforce this thing, you reflect what they've said. Say, you feel you haven't been treated fairly. I guess the trick is to try to, you know, when you do this, when you do this kind of reflection, is to try to use exactly their words without imposing you know, any of your interpretation on top of this or formulating the question in a way that's steering them in some direction. You're, you're simply playing back to them literally what they just said. Maybe this is a way to avoid introducing your biases uh, into this as much as possible. Uh, and it's a way to probe them to provide more information about why they felt that way. Hopefully, concrete examples, specific situations that have contributed to that feeling. Okay. Uh, but I think the trick here is to to not change the wording. Right? You're 
asking them back literally the thing they just said. You don't want to interpret it. Um, okay, indirect follow-ups. So uh, as simple as tell me more. This is interesting. Tell me more. Or I would like to hear more about this particular point. Could you elaborate a bit, please? So very, very basic things. Very effective technique. We use this a lot in teaching is simply pausing. Um, silence is awkward. Did you know this? <laughs> So if a teacher asks a question to the class and you know, the students don't immediately answer, the longer the teacher waits before moving on, the more awkward it gets. Right? It's the same with an interview. The longer you wait when you introduce these pauses, people will feel obligated to provide you with more information. It looks like you're still waiting for information, so they will offer more. And obviously, you know, you can't do this too much. You can't overdo it. Uh, otherwise, it becomes annoying. But used, used appropriately, it can be very effective, both in a classroom setting as well as in an interview. I think probably also depends on the participants. Some participants would be uh, not so uh, comfortable. With those pauses. Correct. Yeah. So, of course, he was a fan. Yeah. I guess we need to read the participant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you ask, you feel you have not been treated fairly, I think the answer probably yes or no, which means you cannot get, get more information. Yeah. So then you follow up with another probe, which I don't have here on the screen. Can you think of some concrete situations? Okay. That made you feel that way. Can you walk me through that? Right. So, but, you know, not can you remember concrete situations because that triggers memory. You want the other kind, the one that triggers this active reconstruction. But, but yes, the point is this is not all there is. This is sort of you know one probe of maybe many, right, on the same topic until until you're satisfied that you got everything you wanted. From that participant, good question. Um, okay, so this was sort of about probing. Probing, um, really useful. Okay, so you know, just remember these tips and, and use them. Very, very useful technique to get more information out of your participants in an interview. Um, so remember this. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it ever useful? Like, let's say someone you're interviewing gives kind of a meandering thought process. Is it ever useful to ask them to kind of summarize their points? Because then you're not giving them any bias, but then you're kind of asking them, I don't know if you're asking for their opinion, but I don't know if you think that's good or bad. I think that could work. Yeah, I think asking them to summarize something very rambly they've just told you may help it seems reasonable okay try it let me know <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you yeah um, speaking of ramley people managing the process can be hard um, with difficult participants so everyone, remember active listening so as you're interviewing try to assess the progress and stay alert for cues about how to move the interview forward. Try not to interrupt people when they are uh, telling you things. Rather, take notes and return to interesting things they have mentioned. Um, because maybe they, if you interrupt them, they lose their thought, and you can go back to the thing they were, they were telling you about. Uh, for example, one way to go back to something they said earlier uh, can be as direct as this. A while back, you talked about X. You made a note, you know, as you were listening to them, you made a note about this. Tell them a while back, you talked about X. Would you talk more about that X, please? If you go back to something they said earlier and ask them question. If you happen to have a difficult interviewee, every now and then you'll have somebody that either provides cryptic answers, you know, does you have to like, pry words out of them. 
or just does not stop talking. Both of these can be very difficult. When that happens, no silver bullet here, um, but just you know, common sense things. Make sure they you are clear and, and they understand um, what is required of them uh, and you know, whether the information is anonymous uh, or, or not, if, whether the questions are clear, et cetera. Use pauses and silence to try to pry out more information from them. Um, if they're over communicative and they can't stop talking or they uh, ramble or they stray too far from the things you care about, you can politely interrupt them at some point of when there's a natural pause and ask them to go back to something more on, on point. Something like, that's very interesting. Could we please go back to what you were saying earlier about X? I'd like to learn more uh, about that. I'd like you to tell me more. So you can, you can always do this, steer them back on track to something new. Okay, yeah, some, some basic things, you know, be respectful, but not too submissive, to high status interviewees. Yeah, okay. Reinforcing. So reinforce uh, that people are doing a good job in providing you with information. You know, do this early, do this often throughout the interview provide positive feedback. But again, try not to reinforce specific content because that's when you risk introducing your own biases. But remind them that you're making good progress, that they're helping you. You appreciate their willingness to help in this project and their comments are helpful and useful. Okay. And sometimes you will encounter contradictions between things they have said at different times during the interview. Um, they may seem like contradictions to you. They need not be contradictions to them. So maybe a neutral way to probe them on this. Now obviously, you know, make a note of this, and, and when you get a chance, come back and probe them. You could say something like, "You mentioned X before. You also mentioned Y. Please help me understand the relationship between these two points." Right? They may seem contradictory to you. Maybe they're not to them. You're not imposing that view that they're contradictory. You're just asking them to clarify their relationship. All right, um, record the interviews. We do this because usually um, while you will be taking notes throughout this process, it's always a good idea to take detailed notes. Um, the uh, recording will serve as the ground truth source of data. We will be using the recordings uh, or the transcription of the recordings to do qualitative analysis and to pull original quotes from and whatnot. Because typically you won't be able to you know, take as detailed notes um, as the recording or the transcript can provide. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't take notes. By all means, you should take notes because it you know, allows, you, allows you to probe and, and so on. Uh, but also try to have an audio recording of this conversation that you can then transcribe. In fact, probably a good idea to have two. As often happens, that, I don't know, the Zoom session, say it was a video call or something, or be an audio call, video is off. Uh, the Zoom session crashed or whatever, or the recording got lost, and then you have nothing. So I've seen people, you know, in addition, also use a cell phone or something that just sits on the table and records uh, the audio as well. And, you know, this way you have two uh, audio recordings of the same conversation, and you can fall back on one if, if you lose the other one. One one practice. Um, if you do enough interviews, whatever can go wrong will eventually go wrong. I can guarantee that. That has happened to uh, me and my students that all kinds of things went wrong. Uh, so I'm sure it will happen to you as well. Okay, so this is sort of where um, I wanted to uh, what I wanted to cover. Any thoughts on kind of the mechanics? Viewing based on discussion today or readings, yeah. I'm uh, still yeah, confused about uh, asking and probing. Asking versus probing. So, um, probing are these follow up questions 
everything is asking ultimately. Probing are these follow-up questions. You know, how do you react to something they've said? Uh, okay, so asking is the first question. Uh, probing is the following question. Essentially, you can think of it like this, yes. Right. Asking is kind of the, the top level questions. Probing is more details or you know, follow-ups to something they've said. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about this. So this is a good idea to comparing some potential problem question in advance. Always. Yes. You should always prepare uh, probes as part of your interview plan. Yes. Yeah, but you don't necessarily have to ask all of them. That's right. That's right. You don't uh, necessarily ask all of them. But you're sort of ready with them, you know, in case in case you need to ask. Yes. So what I wanted to do, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to what I wanted to do, um, I, I guess you can um, you can start doing this now and you can think of this for uh, Thursday. We can talk more about it uh, at the beginning of class on Thursday. I would like you to maybe in pairs workshop an interview guide for this set of questions we've been uh, thinking about, trying to understand the existence and nature and prevalence and or strength of potential biases in student evaluations of teachers at CMU. So maybe you're informing, I don't know, Farnham or something on some changes to practices within the university. Um, Maybe you just are a researcher building some theory or testing some theory about possible moderating factors that could mitigate some of these biases. You want to collect some information from people. Uh, maybe you're just curious about the difference between how people perceive these biases and what the evidence shows uh, in terms of strength or prevalence, for example. You know, maybe. There's a lot of perception of some biases, but the evidence does not support that at all, or maybe the opposite, right? Lots of evidence for some bias that people don't yet recognize, etc. Whatever the reasons may be, this is sort of the setting. So you can think of a research question. In fact, you probably have thought of a research question as part of your lit review. And that's a good starting point. Um, you should decide on a sampling frame for participants. Who are you going to interview? Right for you know, this uh, study, is it teachers? Is it teaching assistants? Is it students? You know, is it all of the above? You know, who is your sort of informants here, and why? Why are you choosing that? Um, and develop a short interview guide or interview protocol, consisting of these top level questions and the follow up probes that you would ask these people. I was hoping that we get to do all of this in class, but we, you know, obviously didn't get this far. Um, so you can you can think about some of this uh, on your own. You can do this in pairs if you'd like. I would like to ask you to once you have this guide, actually conduct a couple of interviews for real with people that you identify as important to your study. Um, and record those conversations anonymously, probably, if you would like, um, and use the transcripts. We'll use the transcripts together uh, later to do qualitative analysis. Maybe feed them into chat GPT or something like that. Maybe we do them by hand. I think we talked about maybe splitting the class up in two and comparing how the results of the qualitative analysis would vary between an LLM and humans. So we'll do all of that starting Thursday and some of the next week, maybe. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll send the homework, I'll post one on Canvas with more details. Conduct two or three interviews with real people, okay, for real. Gives you a chance to practice uh, asking questions and probing and listening and all of these kinds of things that we talked about today. That will be the homework. So we will interview people around us. Right? Is, is this the first time that's been done? Like, first time it's been done. Yeah. That I know. I I mean, like previous year of this class. I'm just wondering if like you have done this before. It's different activity. Okay. We've done. We, we've always done interviews, but on a different topic. 
we um, have done them last year. We've done them on um, software to help authors collaborate on a research paper. Think of Overleaf. Maybe you are the designer or developer of software like like Overleaf, uh, and you're kind of collecting pain points and whatnot from authors that are trying to collaborate when they're writing their research. But this year, since we have this new data set and whatnot, and you've already done the lit review, I thought we would change things up a bit. So we'll do some slightly easier. That make sense? So I guess the homework will be the protocol itself, the guide, right? You have to write this up. So roughly a page, you know, questions and, and response. Um, and then conduct a couple of interviews for real and collect transcripts. I expect anonymously. When uh, should this all be done by Thursday or this week? Or... It seems kind of tight to run all of these for Thursday. So probably not. Maybe Tuesday next week? Would that work? Seems reasonable. <laughs> I think Thursday is a bit tight if you yeah. need to schedule them and run them. And <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's not do that. Uh -huh. Tuesday too soon? Does that work? Because a week? I feel like a protocol by Thursday is OK. And then a couple of interviews by Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. <laughs> Um, ideally, <laughs> don't interview each other. <laughs> I mean, I, I won't know, but ideally, don't interview each other. Try to interview somebody that hasn't already thought about this, you know, maybe as much as you have. You've done the lit reviews, you know, you're, you're primed to, um, to think about this and, and about the class. So, try to interview other people. It might, could be students, could be uh, teaching assistants, could be faculty. Maybe teaching track versus research tenure track, whatever. You know, I'm not going to prescribe this. It should it should help with the research questions that you have formulated, and you can stick to the ones you've had in the lit reviews if you're still satisfied with them, uh, or you can come up with new ones. I will give feedback on the lit reviews as soon as I can this week. So hopefully, if there's something in there you know to steer you in a better direction. You will you'll get that in time. Okay. Let's stop here.